and we'll begin. All right, we'll give it a couple minutes while folks join before we get started. All right. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jessica from Greenlight and we are thrilled to host tonight's event with Shakira Bourne launching her new book, Josephine Against the Sea. She's going to be talking with Tracy Batiste, so you are in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Shakira, to Tracy, and to the team at Scholastic for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces right now, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a couple little housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see and hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first way is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like a speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And very importantly, tonight's featured book, Josephine Against the Sea, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person at our bookstore locations 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. every day of the week, and you can purchase Shakira's book and many others on site or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. I'll drop that buy link in the chat in a few minutes. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Okay, some introductions. Our interviewer tonight is Tracy Batiste. She is a New York Times bestselling author best known for the middle grade Jumbie series, including The Jumbies, Rise of the Jumbies, and The Jumbie God's Revenge, as well as Minecraft The Crash. Her picture book debut, Looking for a Jumbie, and a middle grade nonfiction book, African Icons, 10 People Who Shaped History, are both forthcoming in fall 2021. Tracy's also on the faculty at Lesley University's MFA program in creative writing. She's gonna be speaking tonight with our featured author, Shakira Bourne. She is a Bayesian author and filmmaker. She once shot a movie scene in a cave with bats during an earthquake, but she's too scared to watch horror movies. She enjoys exploring old graveyards, daydreaming, and eating mangoes. She currently resides in Barbados in the Caribbean and spends most of her time staring out at the sea, thinking about new stories to tell. And this book that's launching tonight is one of them. Her brand new book, Josephine Against the Sea, is a magical, heartfelt adventure inspired by Caribbean mythology about lovable mischief maker Josephine. When a vengeful sea creature starts dating her daddy, can Josephine convince her friends to help her and use her cricket skills to save daddy before it's too late? You'll have to read the book to find out. And we're very lucky tonight to start things off with a music video that's directly inspired by Josephine Against the Sea. So Shakira can tell you a little bit more about it after we watch it, but please enjoy to start things off some music and dance. Here we go.
Hello, everyone. <laughs> I've been, I'm seeing you in the chat. I'm so excited that you are all here. Oh my gosh, it my heart is full. Honestly, thank you all for showing up. Um, I want to thank Neil Marshall um, and Klish Giddens for shooting that video. It's like the perfect introduction to this book and it shows Josephine's and Maurice's relationship. Sienna Clark, who plays my Josephine, um, Olivia Hall, who plays Maurice, thank you all so much for making this a little special. I just wanted to do something a little different. Yes, I am wearing the crown because this is like the <laughs> this is the only time it would be normal to wear this headpiece right here, besides prop over. But thanks to COVID, we have to wait another year. Yes, but yes, I just want to thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to start with reading from Josephine Against the Sea. <laughs> it comes out today. Thank you, Stilastic. Thank you, Mallory, my editor. Thank you, Marietta, my agent. Um, yes, I will do all the thank yous later, but I just want to say that I appreciate this journey so much and you all made it so great for me. Thank you, Sydney, who was the awesome publicist that put this whole thing together. So um, I just want to read from where Josephine sees Marisa first time. I think it's such a good lead on since um, the video kind of stops there. That's when Josephine sees Maurice. So that is actually chapter six. So here we go. <laughs> Though the boards in the kitchen are creaky, I do not hear her coming. She wears a white and red cotton dress, which floats like a cloud around her curvy body. As she approaches, her hips move, move from side to side as if her bones were made out of springs. Her gigantic thick afro brings her almost to daddy's height. She slicked down her hair at the side, giving it a wet yet not greasy look. Her smile is so big, I can't see the color of her eyes. She wears a small silver hoop in her nose and her teeth sparkle like they've been polished. Her cheekbones are so pronounced. It looks like she's sucking in her cheeks and this should be unattractive, but those cheekbones combined with a long neck bring an air of elegance. She seems too glossy, too refined. If she stood still long enough, she could be mistaken for a poised mannequin. I hope you like fish. If a harp could speak, it would sound like her. She presents a large tray of flying fish with flair, like she's a model on a game show. I'm sure my face has the same expression as those dead fish, mouth wide open in paralyzed horror. Theme, this is Maurice, my lucky charm. Daddy lifts me up and swings me in the air. The boat was full with fish today, even in my dismay. I take note of the fact that daddy referred to Joanne as the boat. He kisses me hard on the cheek, then turns to Maurice. I'm going to cook my famous fish soup for you tomorrow, he says, taking the tray from her hands. Cook for me? Maurice's eyes widen just enough for me to see that they're dark brown. Daddy puts an arm around her shoulders and they return to the kitchen. This isn't a good time for company. She can come back in about 10 years. I follow them, wheels already turning in my head and sit on a stool by the bar to watch them bone the fish. Daddy is explaining to Maurice that after the scales, head, tails and fins are removed, you slice on either side of the backbone. Daddy pulls the backbone out with a knife and Maurice grimaces. This is Bean's favorite, he says, pointing to the fish melt stuck on the side of the backbone. When I first found out that melts were actually flying fish eggs, I tried to spit them back out, but the fried delicacy was so delicious, I could not stop from chewing them. Maurice pokes the fish guts with a long manicured nail and wrinkles her nose with disgust. She rubs her hands against the counter like she's trying to wipe away germs. Daddy laughs. Maurice sells jewelry in the market, so she's accustomed to gems, not guts, he tells me, adding some onions to the chives, garlic, cloves, and green herbs in the food processor. He's going full gourmet, even making the Beijing green seasonings from scratch as a marinade for the fish. Daddy pushes a button on the food processor and Maurice jumps back like she's been shot with a bazooka, putting her hands over her ears. Daddy's so focused on pouring vinegar in the chute that he does not realize, he does not notice Maurice gaping at the appliance like she's an angry hollow monkey. Nope, 
this woman is too weird. I'd be doing daddy a favor getting rid of her. I look at the bucket next to Maurice, once again filled with fish scales, bones, and guts. It worked once before, didn't it? I want to help. I jump from the stool and speed over to them before daddy can stop me. Then I pretend to stumble. To my surprise, it is Maurice, not daddy, who reacts first and attempts to catch me. I still manage to knock the bucket from the counter and all the contents spill over the right side of Maurice's light cotton dress. Josephine, daddy snarls. I try my best to, as I can to, I try as best as I can to look remorseful. Maurice, I am so sorry. He grabs a kitchen counter towel from the sink and starts wiping the slimy muck from her arm. Maurice stares down at the dress. I wait for her to march out with in disgust, but to my astonishment, when she looks up, there is a smile on her face. She turns to my daddy and pushes out her right leg. The water has made the light cotton material almost transparent. Marie slowly lifts a shapely leg out from the dress. There isn't a blemish on her ginger brown skin, as if a mosquito or sandfly has never touched her. Uh-oh. Who knew it was possible to look seductive while covered in fish guts? Maurice pats the top of my head. Don't worry, Josie Sweets. Your daddy and I forgive you. Right, Vincy? Josie Sweets? Vincy? Daddy gulps and nods, mesmerized by Maurice. I have to put an end to this right now. So sorry that you have to go home to change, Maurice, I say, already heading to the door. Oh, I'm sure your daddy has a shirt or something I can wear, she replies. She lifts her leg even higher and pulls a fish bone from the material. Daddy snaps out of the trance. I, 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 I yeah, um, upstairs, uh, bedroom. Jo Josephine, clean up this mess. Daddy disappears around the corner to go upstairs and Maurice moves to follow him over my dead body. Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> that is such a treat to hear you do it. Because, you know, Thank like you. I, I read it and I feel <laughs> like I hear the, you know, like for me, like all I hear is Trini, but to hear your Bajan accent is really <laughs> quite amazing. So congratulations to you. First Thank you. All. Thank you so much, Tracy, for joining me. Oh yeah, you know, sure. you're a legend. You know, I love the jumbies. <laughs> and, and, and anyone who has not read it yet, you are missing out. Please go get the jumbies. Well, I mean, I feel like the the thing that you know is exciting for me now um, is that there's so many more people writing um, Caribbean mythology, mm -hmm. and so I I don't feel like I'm out there by myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> My friends, yeah. I cannot imagine how it felt. I cannot imagine how it felt having like maybe the only Caribbean folklore middle grade out there. Like that is right. pressure. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yep. Pressure. Yep. yep, but no pressure now because now we have you and we have Josephine <laughs> um, and, we, and we have Maurice who yes, is- we have Maurice. I gotta, I gotta tell you, like honestly, mm -hmm. just her calling the nicknames, Josie Sweets and Vincy, <laughs> like already, like I'm just like, yeah, you definitely need to get rid of this Yeah, she lady. needs to go. <laughs> you. <laughs> it's just, no, it's, it's like literally no good. So, uh, you know, I wanted to ask when you and I met, we met in Trinidad mm -hmm. um, at a Bocas Lit Fest a few years ago. Yeah. And it was when um, uh, my fishy stepmom was on the uh on the short list for yes. for the bogus prize and uh like i really really loved that title um, my fishy <laughs> stepmom i thought it was just so cute and so clever because you know exactly what's happening right away yeah but this was this was the caribbean version right mm -hmm. yeah of, of the book so can you tell us a little bit about how this caribbean book my, my fishy stepmom became um, you know, soon to be international bestseller. <laughs> Josephine <again. Your> lips. <laughs> okay. Um, honestly, it has been such a journey, an unexpected journey, you know, um, people in the chat would probably tell you that I, I kind of live my life just pursuing opportunities wherever I have them. And I, I take a lot of risks. And when I wrote my fishy stepmom, I had no idea what I was doing. Seriously, I had no idea about writing for kids. I 
didn't know about middle grade or YA at all, but I knew that there was a competition that was providing an opportunity for an author to be published, cash prize and a publishing deal. Like I had to give it a shot. And so I did not expect, you know, it was three weeks before the deadline. Um, I had a project that was canceled. So I decided, oh, what the heck, let me just write this book. Um, I planned out like a screenplay because remember I had never really written um, a book like this before and so quickly. And so I didn't have much expectations for it at all, but I just decided to, you know, see what could happen. So I Googled how to get an agent um, as soon as, uh, because I had entered a competition the year before and I didn't place, right? It was with a, another book. And I was like, well, I'm not going to wait around for months only to hear that I didn't place again. So I'm just going to see what happens if you get an agent for a book. I Googled how to get an agent and suddenly four months later I'm signed with an agent and I'm a finalist for the competition and suddenly I'm a kid lib writer <laughs> so yeah um yeah that that is how so um the competition provided a regional publishing deal so because I had my U.S. agent uh, Marietta um she I mean you know she's your agent too you know she's amazing um she was responsible then for going on submission to U.S. editors and um, luckily, oh my gosh, luckily she submitted to Mallory at Scholastic who loved the book, um, but she did have some thoughts on a different vision in terms of Josephine's perspective, in terms of like, um, Josephine loved cricket. Um, she wanted to protect her dad. She wanted to see how we could make those two things connect. So I got a revise and resubmit. Um, I rewrote the first six, chap six chapters of the book and um, Scholastic made an offer and that is literally how it happened so well it wasn't quick for me because let me tell you I'm not accustomed I'm not a very patient person so I am not accustomed to how long <laughs> publishing takes you know I self-published two books and you know that's done in 24 hours 48 hours so it was very long to me but in and you know in hindsight when I'm listening to other people's journeys I know it was pretty short um, I was on sub for eight months and yeah, no, after two years of craziness, pandemic, volcano, hurricane, lightning storms, finally. It's there here. it is. So, yeah. There she is. So, am I hearing correctly that you wrote this particular book in three weeks? Or no, was not, it the previous no, no, no. one? No, it was, it was not even the previous one. Uh, so, the first draft was 28,000 words, right? And it's mm -hmm. only 28,000 because for the competition, you had to write 20,000 words. And I was just like, okay, bare minimum. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so by the time um, my fishy stepmom came out, I had double that word count with my editor and my agent doing edits. So no one has actually ever seen that 28,000 word draft. No, this is um, 60, 61,000 words. So it's like I doubled it again. Well, not doubled, like, you know, it's increased by 50% again. So it has been, even though I wrote it in three weeks, at, you know, um, the first draft in three weeks, I have been revising this book for two years, huh? <laughs> which obviously which is the longest I have ever worked on a book um, at the time because I was a short story writer. I know you would finish a short story, you know, a week, a month, maybe two, three months, but never two years, you know? So it was, every single part of this journey has been a learning experience. Sometimes that's the best way though, right? Yeah. Like you don't, you don't really know exactly what's involved and you just kind of like, you dive in because you don't have yes. any expectations and you're yes. just like, okay, this is what's happening. This is what we're <laughs> going to do. Kaboom. Yes. And you know what? I, I think I prefer it that way because I always tell people that if I had known everything that I know now, I would have been like, oh, that's too stressful. I may just self-publish this, you know? But, um, you know, I'm so glad that I didn't know because it was easier to take those risks. I didn't know how big the risks were. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and, and now that you've figured this out and now that you've done it, being mm -hmm. able to do it again is not going to seem so daunting because you've already yeah. done it. Yes. Right? Yes. So it'll be a lot easier next time. Yes. Fingers um, crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> I mean, since this, I mean, since, you know, writing novels was not your, your ballywick, um, mm -hmm. you know, starting out, you, you were a filmmaker, you were writing short stories. Mm -hmm. How do you think, especially that filmmaker mm -hmm. eye, like, how mm -hmm. do you think that really 
plays into your ability to write scenes because your scenes are really quite beautiful. Even the one mm -hmm. that you just you just read mm -hmm. with the fish guts falling and Maurice, you know, lift, raising her leg and the this the dress going translucent with you know. Mm -hmm covered in fish guts but yet still <laughs> sexy so <Yeah. laughs> how, how does how does one inform the other so um as a short fiction writer i was a complete pantser i just used to open my document i would be like oh i want to write about um the effects of human trafficking and i'm going to tell it through the eyes of an eight-year-old child so and then that's all i would have and i would start writing um when you were, you have so much story you, you i could not pants it Right. So what screenwriting did was show me structure and it taught me structure because I was writing feature films. Right. And those uh, are 120 pages to, uh, approximately. That's two hours. So I cannot pants. I can't pants a, a screenplay. You can't, you know, you have to plan it out. And so it, it really allowed me to learn more about the triad structure, different theories about writing screenplays. And so that is why I was able to write Josephine so quickly the first time, because I planned it like I would a screenplay and as part of um, writing screenplays there when I initially learned there is something that we we did called a seamless worksheet and what it is is that for every single scene you would write out the goal of the scene and what you want to accomplish the three or four events leading up to that goal and then what happens next and what the person suppo is supposed to learn from that scene and how it advances the story forward so I don't fill out seamless worksheets anymore but the theory is still there. So even as I'm planning a scene, I kind of know exactly what beats I want to happen. And then the thing about screenwriting is you have to be able to show the audience a story, even if the volume is, is completely gone. That's how I train myself. If there was no volume, would the audience still be able to follow the story and know what's going on? So it forced me to think in images and advance the plot through images. So I did the same with the book because, you know, I was panicking. <laughs> there was two weeks left. I was like, okay, thinking in images, thinking about plot. How can I advance the story without using any dialogue? But then, bonus, I do have the additional um, use of dialogue. So I use the dialogue then to just show um, character, show humor. And yet, yeah, all of this is from screenwriting, you know, even like the structure of the narrative. Because um, with fiction, you know, I, I try to be overly descriptive and flowery, you know, you're writing Caribbean short fiction, so you're thinking, oh, I have to go on for two pages about the scenery, <laughs> you know, um, but I'm not naturally that type of writer, you know, I'm a short, snappier type of writer, and it's it just lended itself so well to screenwriting, and then for writing Kid Lit. So it really, I, it wasn't planned, of course. But screenwriting, I don't think I could have written this book without learning the craft of screenwriting first. That's amazing. That's actually, yeah. you, you've given people some really good tips, actually, about how to approach a novel and how to mm -hmm. think about scene, especially yeah. like a lot of people, I think, um, don't think about scene when they think about writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and for me, like scene is so important. You really need to flesh that out. You really need to understand what's happening there. You, mm -hmm. you do need to follow those beats. You do need to have expectations for yourself as you're going yes. into a scene and know how you're going to write yourself in and then write yourself back out yes. Of, yes. of a scene, you know, like the, the, and those transitions as well, you know? Yes. So that is really quite amazing. So I love that. So thank you so much for that. You're very and welcome. you mentioned um, mm -hmm. dialogue. And mm -hmm. I, I do have a question about dialogue. You are able to use uh, Bajan dialect mm -hmm. in the story without it becoming a hindrance for those who might not understand it. For me, I love it. And, you know, I get it, of course, because I'm a Caribbean girl. But um, I thought that the way you were very deft in the way that you were able to handle how much of that you were putting into the book um, and how much you held back. So mm -hmm. what, what, what was the thinking craft wise mm -hmm. um, for, you know, how much dialect you were going to put in? Yeah, so this is an amazing question because I have, uh, as a short story writer, I spent so long being worried about writing dialect because I always felt that 
um, especially when you're submitting to um, editors overseas. I always felt like they would think that I don't know basic spelling and grammar and not that it's a deliberate choice of language, right? A language style. And I, I think I told this story, but it's so good, I'm gonna tell it again. <laughs> um, I had Sam Bocas Lit Fest. My gosh, Bocas, we have learned so much from you. Okay, so they had Irvin Welch, who was a Scottish author of Train Spotting. And he came, um, he was doing a, a talk, and I looked at his writing for Train Spotting, and the entire thing was written in Scottish language, you know? And I was like, it was like an assault to my eyes at first. I could not understand how this was a cult phenomenon and it was not in standard English. You know, when I struggle so much at that time, when I use the word wanna or gain, I would struggle because I would feel as if someone would think that, you know, I don't know grammar. So I asked him if he ever thought of, ever had to change it to standard English. And he looked at me like I was the silliest person to ask a Scottish author why he would change a Scottish book with Scottish characters you know, back to standard English. And he was like, no, <laughs> he did not even try. He was not even trying to be eloquent. He was just like, no, I didn't change it. And at that moment, I decided to stop being um, self-conscious about Caribbean dialect. I decided to use it unapologetically because if you don't get it, then it's not for you, one. If, if you don't want to understand it, then the writing maybe not, is not for you. And um, I kind of developed my own way of writing it for um, wider audiences, where I would try to use as much context as possible to explain any words that I think may be unfamiliar. And then I also, I did not change the spelling of the word if it sounded the same way in standard English. And instead, so instead of writing D-E, I would use the, because I know that when a Caribbean person reads it, they will say D in their head. You know, even if the T-H-E there are, in, instead of saying you, they will say you, Y-U-H. So I just um, focus more on the rhythm of the sentence. I would read it out loud and make sure that it sounds correct. It has the right music to it. But then it is still understandable for people to read, you know. And you just need to be open-minded, I think. Because it's, it is clear. It is nowhere as complicated as train spotting. You know, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear. And... I try to just be as consistent as I can with some spellings, you know, and I, I think it works well just focusing on the music because to me, when a Caribbean person reads it, they will hear the rhythm of the language. They will hear the auntie and the granny talking to them. And then when someone who's not from the Caribbean hears it, they will perfectly understand and still maybe get a taste of the rhythm. Hopefully, hopefully. But, you know, I that is how I, I deal with it. And it, really, the spirit guides me. <laughs> in terms of deciding <laughs> how much you know because you know as you would know sometimes we are not consistent with um our our when we use um the dialect you know something we switch from english to dialect all the time yeah. so it's really me just going with what makes sense to me and staying true to the character right and like in yeah. the moment right yes. you're like okay yes. what makes sense here yes if sense this person is this? angry maybe they will pronounce this word a little bit more like yeah, I just go with the character and the spirit. <laughs> right. I yeah. love I love you talking about the musicality of mm -hmm. the language mm -hmm. because that is one thing that we really really have in the Caribbean. Like in the Caribbean, we talk like we're singing all the time. <laughs> that's, just, that's just the whole thing. And so to be able to really lean into the musicality of it. And it's not just in the dialogue that you're leaning into the musicality yes. of it. You're leaning into it um, in all of the descriptions and, and everything, you know, yes. like, um, you know, in that scene that you read earlier when you were talking about um, Maurice's cheekbones for, or yeah, it, with, you know, yes. like the cheekbones and the, and the, the long neck and the, you know, like there is a little bit of this undercurrent of a beat that is happening in there um yes which i really really love so i'm you, so glad i'm so glad you said that because when i was writing that scene i just kind of imagine like how because you know in screenwriting every character needs a moment you know the first time you see a character on screen is the more is very meaningful in screenwriting so i was like okay so f maurice this is the first time we were seeing her she needs to dance out of there like there's a steel pan playing in the kitchen you know <laughs> you know so um you know that kind of influenced all of the words that I chose and the descriptions that I chose because I was just kind of thinking 
how would she dance out of there with her hips swinging? Like, look at me, I am here now. So all your problems are solved. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So, um, you know, so let's talk a little bit about the mythology. There actually mm -hmm. is a question um, in the chat. Allison mm -hmm. um, did ask a chat uh, about the mythology and I, I had a question about that as well. Yeah. Um, so the whole thing with sort of the wicked stepmother mm -hmm. and and the father um, is very much a Cinderella mm -hmm. um, format. Yes. And, and, you know, and then we have all of these Caribbean creatures coming mm -hmm. into this Cinderella format. Um, and then, of course, there's also the whole thing with the with the tree, which also mm -hmm. features very mm -hmm. much in the older Cinderella stories. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to us a little bit about this blending of, you know, sort of traditional, what's traditional, yeah. uh, white. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'll just say it. I'll yeah. just say it. <laughs> just sort of European fairy tales. Uh -huh. and Caribbean mythology. Talk to, talk to us about how you, um, you blended those so, into the story. It's so, it's so interesting um, because I, I know it is a Cinderella type format, but Cinderella was nowhere near my mind when I was thinking it, when I originally did this story at all. I was not thinking about any European <laughs> tale at all. All I was thinking about was um, the character and the, like what she is, where she comes from, where she's rooted, what features she has, and how those could best provide conflict for Josephine's goals. And I think I started, I started with that. It's about Josephine, it's about figuring out what she wants and how best to make it as difficult as possible for her to get it. So I, I, I wasn't thinking about that either. I, I was just thinking about all the stories I heard growing up, you know? And it's, it's hard for me to, to, to really define how I blended it because I think I just told the story I wanted to tell for a very long time, which is about, you know, this girl who has an encounter with this folklore character. And the great thing about the, our mythology is that it is not good on evil, right? With the Cinderella story with the stepmother, she's just, you know, evil and jealous. I, I don't think there's any more depth to her, you know, not, not counting the movies right now. But, you know, in the original fairy tales, that, that was it. She was vain right. and jealous. That, yeah. that, our characters are not like that. Our characters can go from a hero to a villain with a flip of a coin, you know? They can both heal and cause um, danger. They can love and they can hurt. And it all depends on the type of mood they're in because they're gods. And they need to say that all the time. They're gods. We are at their whim, you know? So if we piss them off, then we will face the consequences. If we love and worship them, then we will be blessed. Is it's a simple enough concept. So I really wanted to have that duality, you know, and show it in that character. So I want to have instances where we see Marisa's power to do good. And we also saw her power to do serious damage, you know? And so I don't think, I don't think that the, um, I think maybe the European tales are a bit more black and white. I didn't want that at all for my story. I wanted everybody to see that Josephine is in a position where she does have a person who can solve all of her problems, but because of stubbornness, miscommunication, trauma, some ego, and some pettiness, suddenly these two characters who, def who seem to have goals that are in alignment clash horrifically, and I, 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 I think that that's so great to explore. So, it um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, so, it's so much more interesting when you have conflict with people who are not entirely good and not yes. entirely bad like Josephine yes. is really mischievous yes and a little bit out of line yeah she's very spoiled let's not you know, let's not hide uh, it right yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, she's, you know she's definitely yeah I mean she's yeah she's she's definitely daddy's spoiled child yes um and she's had dad you know to herself for five years and it must have been yeah. very traumatic for her you know losing her mother yeah. Um, and so all of a lot of that comes into play too, like missing her mom, like that scene with the with the mother's clothing, for example, yes. yeah. um, is a really difficult scene. And you cannot imagine somebody coming into a space knowing a child or a family has lost a loved one and like throw the 
you know, the things away, it like, it really pulls you into this, yeah. this other space, right? But we do see Maurice doing some nice things, right? When they have that moment where she's singing, where she goes up to this woman who, um, you know, maybe is infertile, mm -hmm. uh, maybe can't have a kid. Um, mm -hmm. And you see this sort of, this nicer side to her. She's not this one dimensional character as yeah. you mentioned. But I, I feel like, honestly, like uh, the European stories, um, their European fairy tales were all written by men. <laughs> yes. So, yes. you know, maybe not, you know, a super grasp on, yes. on the feminine. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And you know, the thing about the the folklore, I, did, I wasn't quite a, as aware, I knew about Mama Glow and I knew about that part of the folklore, but I wasn't as familiar with the Mami Wata folklore until I really started to do research. And as I was discovering things, I was like, oh, oh, I need to put this in. Oh, I need to show that. And it became a really difficult struggle because, you know, it's Josephine's story and Maurice is still the antagonist. But at the same time, I started learning more about Maurice as I was writing and revising yeah. and realizing, oh my gosh, she has so much more story to tell, you right. know? So uh, it all can't go in one book, you know, I, it can't go in one book. Thankfully I have the opportunity to put it in another because oh. I got the idea for a sequel while I was revising and Scholastic gave me the go ahead. Yes. To that break Josephine amazing. against the heart man. <laughs> that yes. is amazing news. Yes. So that is um, amazing. Okay. See now, now the, the chat is blowing up because I'm <laughs> just as excited as I am. <laughs> so that is really great to hear. I'm yes. so thrilled, especially because, you know, like the idea of these kinds of conflicts, there is a lot of it, right? Yes. There, you know, especially when I started working on the Jumbie series, I also started looking at West African folklore yeah. um, and mythologies. And Mami Wata became um, like a really big part of that, you know, yes. like who was Mami Wata? how did she come over to Caribbean islands? Yes. And then the other thing with the Caribbean islands, and you have a father who is Guyanese. Yes. And they are in Barbados. And, but you know, there is this idea of people from various Caribbean islands blending together. Yes. And the fact of the matter is, as these stories traveled, they traveled a little bit differently yes. to different <laughs> they took islands. on different personalities which is what i love because right. there is no mommy water type manifestation in barbados we don't have any barbadian mermaid lore like we know about mama glow mama the low um but we don't have a particular character here so i had the freedom to pick and choose which personality traits and skills and powers i thought one would make a great story but then it was kind of building a character that would represent like what would uh, mommy want to be like who has an excessive amount of salt in her system <laughs> like, you know we have a lot of ocean so he was able to ima like reimagine things like that and you know it's a whole world that could potentially be explored not that you know that was not the plan this was a standalone but i don't know what i'm saying to you like that was not the plan <laughs> that's okay because, listen, you know, the first Jumbies book was also a standalone. Um, yeah. And then there was much more to explore. And I think it's because there is all of this, right? There, yes. There is all of this, um, the, all of these different stories, all of these different um, mythos to, to mm -hmm. pull from. And I think it's really great that you yes. are really inventing, you're taking it and inventing your own and starting your own mythology specifically for Bajan culture, but it's not just, you know, for, for people from Barbados. It really yeah, it is. is for everybody. Um, and I just, oh, as somebody's saying, um, they call her Mami Wata in the-, in the um, Bahamas, Bahamas too, well. Fair, yeah, Fair Mates think, in Guyana. Yeah. yeah. River I mean, Mama is, is another, another term. Exactly. There's yeah. like, there's so much of that. So then I, you know, then I have, you know, this question about um, Maurice. Mm -hmm. Her out, you know, her her signature colors yes. <laughs> are red and white, and the the um, the dancer, the very gorgeous, beautiful dancer who like amazingly dances in wet sand, which is hard. It was very hard. <laughs> it was very a dancer, hard. 
That is not a I was there you. telling her, the ocean belongs to you. Move with the waves. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. It's, yeah, that's that's not an easy thing. Dancers are used to like, you know, solid ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the dancer's wearing uh, black with red and mm -hmm. Marisa's colors are red and white. Can you talk mm -hmm. to us about the symbolism there? Why you choose these colors? Because, yeah. you know, when we think about mermaids, we don't typically think of... Um, those colors, we think, you know, we tend to think of like blues and greens. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, it, that's actually something that I uncovered when I was doing my research. There was an article that said that um, the colors of the Mamiwata are red and black. The red represents blood, violence, and danger. And the white is spirituality and the feminine body and cleansing in some way. So those colors are actually part of the mythology from, um, from Africa. So I was like, hmm, I guess um, I can use this to foreshadow a little bit for people who may have an idea of who the character may be. I could have her in red and white all of the time. And it just seemed like a really great way to do it. Um, you know, I find it so odd, so interesting, not odd, because, you know, in China, red is fortune, right? right. But here, red is danger. So it just goes back to that dual nature of, 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 of Maurice. And to me, the red and the white represented that dual nature where it's like okay is she wearing red today or is she wearing white what type of mood is she in and do i dare like um press her no do i mess up her no and so it was just my way of trying to stay a little bit more true to the original mythology and then also use it as foreshadowing and then to represent the dual nature of this character so yeah i'm glad that you picked up on that <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of things to do um yeah. with a wardrobe <laughs> Yeah, it's true. That's why I was like, no one is going to get this, but I get it. <laughs> well, it's true that the, uh, you know, like Mami Wata's uh, devotees in on in uh, the West African coast, um, you know, like they wear white all the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Um, because it is the symbol of, of purity and um, also because it represents water. Like there's yes. that whole, um, you know, like the, the uh, what is it? The, the spiritual plane, like, you yes. know, crosses water yes. and so anything white uh sort of represents water and access to that spiritual plane yes um so i feel like you know even if people are not cognizant of that when they first read the book mm -hmm. these are things that sort of get embedded in there yes maybe sometime <laughs> later they will like figure it I out i hope so and let me say it's just such so refreshing to talk to someone who so understands the mythology oh my god i love you tracy but yeah like um yeah they oh, may not get it immediately day. yeah they may not get it immediately but in the next book when someone wears white and red they may go whoa who are you? <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I'm okay. So we're already at like six forty-five. I did not even realize. I'm like, <laughs> like what happened? I and I started this whole thing. So I'm like, I'm so good at keeping time, and I'm like, you know, we're just having a good time. So anyway, I did want to ask about the silk cotton tree. Yeah. And how you know, like, I mean, there are very specific mythologies that. Yeah. Um, deal with the silk cotton tree um, throughout um, the Caribbean. Like Gang Gang Sarah, for example, yeah. is, is, you know, like one of those witches who like tried to fly back to Africa, but, you know, she climbed up the silk cotton tree and then she couldn't do it. And so talk to us a little bit about, to, you know, inform us, please. Yeah. About so, you know, tree. as you said, is the spiritual, the silk cotton tree is spiritual in many cultures. And, you know, when Africans came over to the Caribbean, they too considered it spiritual. They felt as if the ancestors were inside of that tree. They imbued the spirit of the ancestors in that tree. And then also it was a rumor that evil spirits lay in that tree. So you should never cut into a silk cotton tree because one, you don't know if you'll get a good ancestor or evil spirit and it is just bad luck and brings misfortune. And I had read so many different stories and I can't remember where I read them about a person who, I don't know if, my gosh, I don't even know if it's true or real. This is, this is why it's so amazing anyway. But uh, basically a group of workers were hired to cut down a tree and they saw it was a silk cotton tree and they refused to touch it. And the overseer, he was like, you know, this is nonsense, I'm gonna cut down this tree. And when he tried to cut down the tree, he immediately um, got, I can't remember if he died in some way or if he was found dead, uh, but he, it was definitely misfortune on him, right? 
And so it's it's just this this thing where you say, this is a silk on a tree. You do not cut into it. You know, you don't take that risk. And even if you don't believe, if it's not true, right? You don't want to take a chance just in case, you know? And here, a couple of years ago, there is a tree on um, the property of a school. And as you would know, the silk cotton, the pods, the fibers, sorry, uh -huh. um, come down and it actually causes people to wheeze and sneeze. So there was this big debate on whether the silk cotton tree should go. But then they couldn't cut it down because it was deemed national of national importance. So I was like, is it really of national importance? Or did someone have an encounter with that tree? And there's this on on this 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 knowledge that you were never to touch this tree, but we can't tell people it's because of the evil spirit. So right, we're gonna right. say of national importance. We're gonna say, yeah, we're gonna yeah. say, no, no, this is an important tree. It's not about mythology or anything. We're not scared. Yes. Yes, exactly. So, you know, I, I, I found that so great. And that scene is in the book. So, you know, we have Miss Mo saying, you know, it is a, a, a tree full of evil spirits. Don't cut into it. And then we have Josephine who did not listen and actually cut into it. So um, I, I just I just thought that it was so great to show that mythology does not only have to be of these fantastical characters. It could be something as simple as a, as a tree, you know, yeah. a sacred tree. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go to some questions in the in the um, in the Q and A, and let's see. Uh, Lloyd Garrett is asking, um, mm -hmm. how much did your own experiences as a child growing up in Barbados influence Josephine's character, <laughs> and how did you choose her name? Well, that's a, hi, Lloyda. Uh, that's an easy question. Josephine is the daughter of a good friend, Lizelle, who is here. And the, I, Lizelle was like, I love Josephine. And I was like, okay, it doesn't matter what story I tell, the lead character is going to be Josephine. Because I love this little girl so much. She's adorable. And when she grows up and she reads the story, she is going to be so thrilled and that was that's the whole point of writing these stories you know so people can see themselves represented in the book so if i actually have a josephine and there is an akai akai is my little cousin you know Aww. so when, he, when they grow up they will have books with their names inside of it you know akai as in particular is a very um unorthodox name so they're not going to be many books where you see an akai yeah right, right. so yeah. yeah so i thought that was really good but um i definitely <laughs> But some of my experiences growing up as a kid um, in that book, I love to explore. You know, there was no internet. I know I'm dating myself, but there was no internet. You literally had to go outside and make your own entertainment. And I did that by exploring the neighborhood, pretending to be a spy, pretending to have adventures, exploring old houses. And to me, that's what Josephine and the Kai kind of do. Like they just kind of make their own entertainment. Unfortunately, it's not good for other people in the neighborhood when it, they can't get up to mischief. But it was just about that sense of freedom of going outside and, you know, being entertained and, and enjoying yourself. Um, my experiences with, with school and my feelings about my school uniform, <laughs> those are in there. You know, I did not like that at school. I remember the girls had to Stand, stay after assembly and then a teachers will measure how long your skirts were to make sure that they're over your knees and if they were too short then you had to take your get your hem taken down and I was so upset I was like what is offensive about knees you know <laughs> so some of that and you know that's the thing about writing you know um I didn't intend to put the stuff in there but you know, it came out, you know, in panic, in yeah, writing. Part of your the lived experience. Yes, so. exactly. So it came out. And then, of course, cricket. Um, I saw a question about cricket. and Yeah, somebody, I, Ryan was asking if you had yeah, a cricket of team. Of course, my favorite cricket team is the West Indies. I am not going to pretend. But I do have to admit that when the West Indies weren't playing, I I had a soft spot for Sri Lanka. I am oh. Not, right. But anyway. Talk to my dad. My dad <laughs> yeah. Sri Lanka. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, but, you know, I, I loved cricket growing up and I so wanted to play, but the opportunities were not accessible to me. Um, when I was finally able to try out for a cricket team, I was in my 20s. I had I no fear. I realized how hard the ball was. So that was not for me. So Josephine was kind of like manif me manifesting my cricket dreams through her, giving her the skills that I wish that I had. 
So there's a lot of me um, <laughs> inside of this book in terms of growing up in Barbados. And that's because I really wanted to show a slice of Barbadian life. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to show a Barbados that you would not see on a cruise ship stop or, or you would not see in a tour. I want to show how the people actually interact with each other and how the community relates to each other. Yeah. All right, that is excellent. Okay, so let's see. Oh, wait, hold on. I lost the whole thing that I was just Good. gonna ask. Okay, okay, we answered the cricket question. Yeah. Um, so we see, we see that the silk country is very important country, in Guyanese folklore. In Guyanese folklore as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like, yeah, there's like, you know, throughout the Caribbean, different Caribbean islands have, you know, various stories. There's this whole story about Papa Bois, mm -hmm. you know, sort of um, trapping the, the, you know, the, um, the angel of death in a silk cotton tree. There's, mm. a, you know, like this whole thing and, and God sends somebody down you to, must like, send me, you must send me story. to like loosen Papa Bois' lips. Yeah, there's like a whole, you know, it's a lot. I love <laughs> it's that. definitely a lot. Um, Ryan is asking um, uh, about if you have any tips on writing gray morality in contrast mm -hmm. to black and white morality, especially for middle grade um, with the folklore in this book? Mm, that's a good question. I know. I think right? the best answer yeah. is to write about people because none of us are pure gray, I mean, pure black and white. You know, we all have positive and negative traits. So think about some, like, just write a person, make sure that it's a fully realized character. Um, I give this tip all the time, but I like to have two positive um, traits or one positive trait and then have two negative traits or make two traits contradictory. So make them both insecure and, lo and loyal or like, you know, something that doesn't seem to go together, but they do because that's how we, who we are as people. And then you just kind of try to show that in every scene. And if you have a scene where you could show all the traits at once, where you could show both positive and negative, then I think that's the best way to kind of start doing that kind of, um, creating that kind of character. Yeah, that's great. All right. Um, oh, there was another question from Kniki about expectation. You said earlier that there is an expectation, whether an expectation of self or from others, of a somewhat indulgent, if not excessive fawning over the natural landscape in Caribbean mm. literature. Yes. Do you think this is penchant or reliance on exploring nature imagery in the Caribbean? Mm. Is it something that can be balanced with dialogue and story? Or do you think it is an overwrought mechanic for telling stories set in oh. our lands? Oh man, it depends on the writer, man, and what the writer is trying to do. And, you know, I'm not sure, I am sure that every time a writer decide that they want to write two pages about the imagery that it is relevant in some way later to the story, even if it's just that it's being piled on on top, you know, like how we have, um, when you're giving the backstory to, or doing world building, maybe the landscape is their way of doing world building, it's just that it is in a realism, is in a realistic way rather than fantastical. So it really depends on the writer, but I, I personally don't think that anyone is writing to be I hope <laughs> not anyone is ready to be self-indulgent, you know? I, I think that they are trying their best to tell the story in the best way that they think is possible. And, you know, there is some benefit to describing the landscape. Some people love it, you know, um, Lord of the Rings books. People love, some people love it and it's fine. It's just that I am not that type of writer and I'm not even that type of reader. I find that my eyes would kind of start skipping paragraphs. And it's completely fine if a person wants to write that way. Once I think it is pertinent to the story and not just being self-indulgent. I hope that that answered that in some way, um, Nikki. I hope so. But basically, I, I'm not crapping on anyone's style. If that is something that a person likes to do, go right ahead. I actually admire you because it's not something that I'm able to do as a writer. Oh, Tracy, you're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. I, yeah. It's because yeah. A, a siren had gone by, so yeah. I muted myself. Um, but I will say that one of the things that you do really well mm -hmm. is um, you're able, I mean, the, the landscape obviously is kind of a character in this yeah. as well. Like you have that whole um, scene that's at the pool 
with the you know like the near drowning yes, right yes. and then and then you have the whole underwater thing where you know like she goes into the cave to you know discover the essence of Maurice or mm -hmm. um, you know as it were and so you're able to sort of blend those two things the the descriptive bits about about the landscape so we can see the landscape and there's your your filmmaker experience again you know that sort of eye for scene and and your ability to paint a scene but then you are continuously moving it forward yeah. with story at the same time so i think you are doing both at the same time. You're able to um, skirt both of those two things at the same yeah. time, which is- it, it, That's a really good point. But it's just, it's just how I interpret the landscape because I want to show the magic of the land, magic that we don't even acknowledge is magic, you know? But, and I think I do that best as a writer when I have the characters interact with the landscape rather than simply describing it. But that's just my choice as a writer, you know? I'm not saying that a person can't do that. It's just how I prefer to right. have my stories told yeah yeah so i uh, i'm gonna end with this one and this one is about josephine this is yeah. from avion and it's um josephine is so mischievous and spoiled yes and she is <laughs> <laughs> how did you know how far to take her but still keep her likable yeah uh, the simple answer to that is that she was not being any of the activities and the mischievousness and as we would call it in Barbados, hard airs, like any, any act that she did was not out of malice. It was always out of protecting her, wanting to protect her dad and, in, and her love for her father and wanting to protect him. So I think like the motivation, once the motivation behind that is pure, even if it's the most mischievous act, once the motivation is pure, I think that people will be able to relate to her and be like, oh, Josephine, you know, you're so wrong, but you're so cute while you're doing it. <laughs> you know, you're so funny while you're doing it. But it's just to make sure that we all know that it's coming from a place of love. And, and I think once we have that, then it's easy for us to forgive the mistakes that, that most characters make. Um, in terms of how she, how to know if she went too far, <laughs> um, I don't know. I am um, a man. As a as a as a young person, I love practical jokes, you know. Um, so I I think so that I don't think your that. own experience, your own lived <laughs> experience again. Yes, it's true. Okay. I love I love making up stories to scare my cousins. So I guess I I just thought what would be too far for me if I was younger, like what would really get me in trouble, and I would stop there. <laughs> Got it. Okay, that was amazing. Look, Shakira, I am so thrilled to be able to do this with you and i'm only sad that we can't do it in person yes because yes. that would be awesome oh my gosh i, I actually i don't know if, if the world is ready for us to do this in person i think they are let's let's put it out there yeah look it's gonna happen at some yes. point you know, we're gonna get together and whatever happens, happens. yes it's true it's you true don't know. Um, yeah. But I, I am so super excited about Josephine being on the world today and also super excited about this sequel. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, do you have any idea when the sequel might be out? Um, yeah. Have you written it already? Have you started? What's Well, um, I'm currently writing another middle grade. It's actually a middle grade horror that's supposed to be out. Um, you who don't I like did. horror are writing horror. <laughs> I know. I, I don't know what is wrong with me, but I can read horror, but I can't watch it. But you know what? I think that makes it, it work so well because I know what scares me. So I know what would scare other people. <laughs> So that one is actually coming out first. It's called Duffy Island, and it's actually based off of the mythology of Dwens. And it's about a filmmaker who follows her family to a silent retreat on a mysterious island and finds out that it's haunted by Dwens. And for those who don't know, a Dwen is a child who died before they were baptized. So I'm actually working on that right now. So that is scheduled to be released, hopefully um, either late 2022 or early 2023. And just being against the heart man is coming out hopefully in 2023 we'll see oh. um yeah i have it all planned but as you know you can plan a book 
to, you can write as many outlines as you want. It, you only start to know a book when you, as you are writing it. At least that's right. how it is for me. Yep. So we'll see what happens as I'm writing that. But the whole point is, um, and Tracy, I know you have an amazing middle grade series coming out. Please tell us about it as well. Yeah, don't let me, yes. Uh, tell us about it, please. Because people need to know that these books are coming. Um, I'm actually working on a series. Um, it's tentatively called Moko Magic, which, and it's so it, it's, it, it relies on the mythology of uh, Moko Jumbies. And this idea that, um, you know, as we were coming um, as enslaved humans to the Caribbean, that the, the first Moko was, was somebody who tried to follow and their legs like stretched all the yes. way. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so that's sort of where we get the, you know, like this, the whole still walker thing. So it's, um, it's going to be magic. It's, it's not going to be horror like the Jumbie series. Mm -hmm. um, but it's meant to be a little bit of fun and mayhem yes. I <laughs> in love Brooklyn, it. over Brooklyn Carnival. Yes. Um, and it's for persons between eight to 12. It's middle grade as well. So yes, please look out for it. it. Middle grade. So um, we're just, like, we're like, right. We're like waving that flag for middle grade um, mythology, Caribbean mythology fiction. Yeah. Is that what we're doing? I feel like. Yes. We need some more people to join us though. So. Yeah, I see Lisa, Lisa Stringfellow. She has a book coming out called The Comb of Wishes and is also I know, good on I Mermaid. Saw that too. Yes, and that's coming out next year. So, right. you know, the books are coming. The books are the here. Books are and, coming. I know. I'm like, like I'm so I'm super excited. Like we need to like get more and more of them and like yes. flood like yes. literally all of the bookstores and all I think, of the <laughs> yeah before before we go and I already know we're over time I just find this so exciting because as Caribbean people we tend to forget that we need content for younger readers you know people don't start reading as adults they need content that can help shape them as per people they're really impressionable at this age and we need to look at the type of books that we're giving our kids and to have Caribbean content, to explore the mythology, we need to write more content for Caribbean re um, kids. So please, you know, don't always, and this is from a previous adult writer. <laughs> Remember the kids and please produce more stories for kids. Yep. True story. Yeah. All right. So thank you so much. Thank you to Greenlight Bookstore. Yes. For I just wanted us. to say, oh my gosh, I want to say thanks to you guys. It was such a treat to hang out with you for an hour. Um, we're so excited about these new projects and for Josephine to get to see. Um, I'm just saying I'm putting it out in the universe. Next book, we're going to host you in the store live it, in real life. It's going to happen. We'll, we'll make it so. But thank you so much. And congratulations again, Shakira, on the debut. Um, and we are on the launch date and we're all excited to read it. <laughs> Thank you so Thanks. much for making this Love amazing. You, Thank Congratulations. you guys. Congratulations. See you. Have a good night. Bye bye.